All right. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our speaker. All our speakers today are National Rural Health Research. This conference will now be recorded. Deborah Lane, Program Specialist, Alyssa Meller, Director of Operations, and Joe Wyvoda, Chief in Information Officer. Alyssa joined the center in December 2013 and brings over 10 years of managed care Medicaid and Medicare experience. This experience includes care coordination, program development, quality improvement and collaboration with local and state partners. In addition to overseeing operations at the center, Alyssa works with networks in rural communities to understand the critical components of care coordination and how it is an essential part of the new value-based payment model. Deborah joined the center in April of 2015 and brings over 30 years of adult education experience. As a program specialist, she provides education, coaching, and technical assistance to rural health networks on topic, topics such as strategic planning, evaluation, collaboration and community engagement, partnerships and leadership. She utilizes her extensive background in training, facilitation and presentation skills to assist rural health network leaders to accomplish their goals. Joe has been at the center since 2012. He is also a health information technology consultant for rural health innovation. Joe has worked in information technology since 1990 and with HIT since 1993. His work with the Minnesota and North Dakota Regional Extension Center for HIT includes meaningful use assessments, privacy and security risk assessments, readiness assessments, workflow analysis and redesign, project management, quality reporting, and tool design. Along with other staff at the center, Joe provides technical assistance to rural health network grantees nationwide, as well as providing HIT assistance to tasks. Joe has been an IT manager, director of IT, and CIO at several hospitals, clinics, and other healthcare organizations. He has assisted healthcare IT vendors with business planning and product improvement. Joe's expertise is in IT leadership, strategy, service delivery, and the process of innovation. He has led several selections and impl implementations in various HIT systems. Now I'll turn it over to Alyssa, Deb, and Joe. Thank you, Kim. This is Alyssa Meller, and I, today you'll be hearing from predominantly me today with, with some information from Joe as well, too, and Deb will join in our conversation tomorrow. I'd like to echo Kim's welcome, and thank you for joining us today, and, and hopefully tomorrow, as this is a two-part series on care coordination and its role in transforming local health care. Before we begin, I'd just like to give a little bit of background of who the National Rehort National Rural Health Resource Center is. It's a nonprofit organization located in Duluth, Minnesota, and it's, we really dedicate our time, our resources to help sustain and improve health care in rural communities. And we focus this assistance and knowledge and expertise in rural health in, in five core areas, and you can see those on our screen. Over the course of our time today and tomorrow, um, our, our goals of, um, our, our, of our webinar are really to spend some time learning the fundamentals of care coordination, specifically the four main components that makes a successful care coordination model and the importance of involving community partners in that model. We're also going to spend some time and, and, and discuss and, and make sure that um, that facilities in developing these care coordination models consider the importance of um, the underlying support of healthcare information technology. We're also going to talk about um, the concerns in both privacy and security as you're working with multi entities across that continuum of care. We're going to also look at the role of your organization, specifically hospitals and or clinics, and how to engage the local providers and community age community organizations in care coordination. We want this time today to be useful and beneficial for all of you on the line. And I know Kim mentioned that we'll have time at the end of, at end of our hour here today for questions and answers. And um, if I'm not making clear or sense, please use the chat box below um, for a question and I'll, and I'll restate um, and answer that question as well too. So care coordination um, today, what, what we're going to focus on in, in our webinar today 
is care coordination and the triple aim. So we're going to briefly review um, and set the stage on the current healthcare landscape, our approach to healthcare and providing that care, how it's changing, and the importance of care coordination and its role within the community and healthcare system, and how care coordination, we'll talk a little bit about triple aim in a, in a bit as well too. Through interviews that, that Terry Hill has done over the last year and a half and through our experience with rural communities and networks this past year, we've identified that there are four components um, that need to be discussed and thought through thoroughly in, in developing a care coordination model with community partners. So today we're going to define all four of those components, but we're going to do a deeper dive into establishing a target population and an assessment tool. So currently, our current healthcare model is a business model. It's, it's really based on volume. The more you do, the more money you make. And that's not saying that clinics and hospitals are power hungry. It's just they're operating within the system that's been created and established. And knowing that, um, we, 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 it, because it's quantity-based, it's, 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 it's supporting a high, high cost of, of health care. And we're seeing some that low quality indicators, and we're still seeing rates of high chronic illness when you look at our quality metrics and our, and our chronic disease metrics as well, too. And we still have a low access to health care. And so by support a business model based on production and quantity, it's unsustainable. And so we're seeing some trends and some developing changes and transitioning to more value-based models as well. And when you look into and you dive into um, really the components and the predictors of health status, it, it surprises you. And what, what I like about this slide is that it, it, it shows all of the predictors of health status. And I have the, the resource or the source down at the bottom where this information is gathered from. But what's surprising here is, is the, the avenue and the, and the platform that we've been operating in clinical care and health status really only affects about 10% of the predictor of a person's health status, along with 10% of genes and biology. And the big components here that are surprising when we're talking about with folks are that 40% of the factors that, is, that address and affect health status are related to social and economic barriers. 30% are behavioral, and by behavioral, it's, it's engagement, it's person's choices um, involving in that care, and then 10% is envi environment. And so when, when you dive into that and understand um, the needs and, and the predictors of what affects health status, there's a, there's a huge aha moment in, in, in that we, we know healthcare providers can't change the U.S. health outcomes alone. And so we're seeing seeing a transition into value-based models. And, and this is where the triple aim comes in, and I'm assuming um, that most of the facilities organizations are familiar with that term. And triple aim is, is, is where we're focusing reimbursement and payment on better quality of care that's being reported, that we're going to produce better health outcomes. So we're going to lower those um, acute, acute episodes, um, disease, disease areas as well, too. And then while doing that, we have to lower the cost of care to make it sustainable. And so um, as, as organizations and communities are understanding the needs in their areas, they're, they're transitioning looking at and how those models can be more value-based. And so in, in order to do that, I'm just going to quickly um, bring all of these areas up here, is that to order to make a successful value-based model, there really needs to be partnerships with the local providers, the communities, and, and other organizations as well, too, to really help coordinate and affect the care across the continuum. And as, you, as you've seen in that previous slide regarding what factors um, affect health, er, health income, or excuse me, health, predictors of health, in, health status, is that we need to extend that coordination of care beyond our clinical walls of the hospital and clinic and into the continuum of care and identifying those providers that, that will help do that. 
And while, while doing this, we also need to improve our documentation of the quality of the care that we're providing and the outcomes that are happening, and also the efficiencies of that on how we're providing that care as well. And so right now, I'd like to pause for a moment. And since our focus today is really is um, looking at collaborations outside of our hospital and our clinic walls, I want you to, to reflect and take a moment to, to answer this question. Please rate um, the level that your organization works collaboratively with other types of providers in your service area to improve transitions of care and care continuity, continuity. And I'd like to also pause at this moment while you're, while you're reflecting and thinking of that and, and calling attention to a resource that we have available on our website. It's called the Rural Hospital Toolkit for Transitioning to Value-Based Systems. It was just released in September of this year, and it's based off of our Small Rural Hospital Transition Project um, in outcomes and um, what we saw in best practices. And it provides a real structure and framework for, for hospitals as they transition to a value-based model. And this question is, um, is one of the questions in an, uh, a self-assessment that's available to help assess your organizations in some of the core component areas of leadership, strategic planning, patients, communities, and um, measurement in other areas as well, too. So I see we've had um, um, a few a few folks respond here. We've had 14 um, They somewhat agree and strongly agree that their organization is working collaboratively in their area to improve transitions of care as well. And so some of the types of organizations that folks are currently collaborating with are health coaches, primary care providers, local clinic, home health agencies. That's great. And as we progress further in our discussion today, um, we'll, we'll, we'll take into account some of those areas as well, too, and in, in the needs that they, they have and the, and the strengths that they bring to the table. All right, Kim, I'm going to go on to our next slide here. And so these next three slides, um, really, I, I bring forward in, in our discussion today is to really reflect, because we often get asked, well, what is care coordination? How do you define it? And um, this, this first reference to community care coordination is in reference to that it, that it needs to be community-based. It needs to be holistic. And this is from the center. We've adapted this over, over the year to kind of incorporate why, how important care coordination is as we transition into this new healthcare landscape of being reimbursed on value and outcomes and lower cost. Because in order to affect those social determinants of health that we saw earlier, we really need to look at integrating primary care, behavioral health, local health, and community resources to provide person-centered, coordinated services. And I've underlined a couple of words on this, uh, on, in this paragraph. And from, a, from our clinical background, um, I've un underlined person-centered because normally what you, you see here, may, may think about seeing here, is the patient, the word patient. And, and I've underlined person-centered because I think this is important, and I can't stress this enough as, as we think about how we're going to care for people going forward is that it's the person. Whether you're a clinic, you, you refer to them as patients, whether as a social service agency, behavioral health, it's a client. But at the heart of it, it's the person that we're, that we're working together to ban and coordinate care around. And I've underlined the word services here. Um, usually, you, you'll tend to see healthcare services, but I've, I've kept it more generic, and we've kept it more generic due to the fact that, again, it's incorporating many more providers, many more services being brought to the table that need to address some of those social determinants, whether they be from a social service agency, public health as well. The second um, definition <clears throat> that, I'm, that I'm bringing forward here too is, is from RUPRI, the Rural Policy Research Institute. And they published a paper that I would highly recommend you guys go, that you, you pull up and read because it really goes into um, care coordination in rural communities and, and what it takes to support those high-performance rural health systems. 
And again, in this definition that they're using, is it's an opportunity to supplement the diagnosis and treatment priorities of medicine with clinical and non-clinical prevention and management in a system that also supports the social aspects of a patient life that contribute to health. Again, they're incorporating that social aspect, that environmental aspect, to help keep that person well and engaged in their health care. And this last definition, briefly, I want to touch on is from um, the Certification Commission of Health Information Technology. And this is the HIT, the technical aspect side of it. But what, what is cool to see here as well is that, again, they're talking about providing information to clinicians to share and provide next care steps in diagnosis and treatment to assure that the patient is in an appropriate care setting as they transition across settings. And again, appropriate care setting is underlined here because that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, as you're, as you're reviewing and understanding what this person needs to, to, to be healthy and well, that they need to be inpatient in long-term care or in a hospital, but they could be at home with some more appropriate, um, less restrictive supports and or cost-effective supports as well, too. So this definition is supporting how we exchange that information to make sure that that person is in that appropriate care setting. And so the four, the four components that, that um, I mentioned earlier or that we identified through interviews and through our experience that have been established in successful models um, are target population, assessment, care plan, and care team. And the two that, that I want to dive in today are, are related to um, our, our target population and assessment. But, uh, but I'll briefly define all four of them here first. And so target population, when, 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 you hear that, when you hear that word or population is, what I'm referencing is improving the care, health, and reducing, reducing costs for a specific group of people. So it's a definition. You have a clear understanding of who you're working with. Assessment is a tool or a survey used by the care coordinator or team or can it even be by the person itself in reflection of where they're currently at. It really depends on the, the, the population that you're working with to assess the person's level of need for services and coordination. The other two, and we'll dive into these tomorrow, are care plan and care team. Care plan is an individual plan of care that is developed with the person, caregiver, and providers to identify the person's needs. And we've underlined two words here, with and and. And with is to, signify, to, to call attention that this care plan development needs to be developed with that person and or caregiver to help increase engagement in, because as we, as we understand from our data, 40% is behavioral based of, of, uh, of barriers to people. Um, accessing care or being determinants in, in um, their health outcomes. And so when you're developing the care plan based on the needs of the person with, with them and with their caregiver, you're automatically engaging to them on how, how that treatment plan and how, how that plan of care moving forward is going to happen and be, be um, worked with. And providers, again, this is developed that it not only needs to be with the person, but the providers from the standpoint of who is needed to be at the table. So thinking beyond our clinical walls of, of primary care providers and specialties, but really including those other special, those other community partners, whether they be behavioral health providers, social service organizations, home health agencies, as well um, as, as some maybe volunteer organizations or faith-based organizations as well. Care team is a team of interdisciplinary providers identified with the person and or caregiver that represents the clinical, behavioral health, social service, long-term care, and community resources needed to meet the goals and outcomes of the person. And I've underlined providers here because, again, um, when I have previously thought of providers and then when I work with healthcare care um, clinic, clinics and hospitals, it's often referenced as, as those, those providers, those, those um, um, the clinical, the clinical providers. But, but what we need to understand and identify is as we expand and understand the population that we're working with is that that provider term may be larger in the sense that it's those behavioral, social service, long-term care providers, depending on the needs of the person that you're working with. 
So technology. I'm going to pass this over to Joe. And I'm hearing some feedback right now. Um, but I will mute myself for him to talk about technology. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, I, my, the, one of the big points I want to make with regard to technology is that it's not um, – technology should not be driving your uh, care coordination efforts. Technology should be a supporting function. Um, for the last several years, with meaningful use driving a lot of adoption in healthcare, um, we've seen this trend where folks are um, – getting a little burned out on technology, right, and, and putting in a lot of technology that now they're, they're really trying to um, look at ways that they can improve the, um, the per, uh, performance of that technology and how it can work with, with, uh, with their workflows. It's important to keep in mind that technology is really an underlying uh, infrastructure piece of your care coordination process. It is not, it should not drive the care coordination. So um, rather than looking at the electronic systems you have today and how they can um, be used for care coordination, you look at, at how you are going to do care coordination uh, in each of the four components and how the technology that you have or perhaps technology that you need can support that process. So um, we'll be talking more about technology as, as this um, uh, webinar goes on and, and even more so tomorrow. Um, think about technology can include a lot of things. It can include um, facsimile machines. It can include post-it notes on somebody's screen. Um, it, can, it, it includes health information exchange and electronic health records. Um, that's, those are all technologies, and we have to be comfortable um, using incremental approaches and saying, Let's, let's uh, keep improving by um, having the technology support our processes, not the other way around. Um, and I'm a, a technology guy really advocating that we do that. Um, and there are a lot of different technologies, some that are really emerging, like web-based, cloud-based um, care coordination systems that really lie outside of what we've seen as electronic health record or as a a certified product that you'd use for meaningful use. So uh, the point I really want to make is technology is the infrastructure, it's not the driver. Great. Thank you, Joe. And like Joe mentioned, um, technology will really be d talked about and dived into more discussion. Question and answers can happen at the end of this discussion as well, too, but I'll, um, please keep in mind for tomorrow as well. And so, as, as we've talked about and briefly mentioned, um, in creating and, and when you're establishing and working with your community organizations, there are four components um, to a model that need to be thought through, not only from the hospital perspective, clinic perspective, but also with your community partners as well, too. Um, and so, I, I say these components not in any particular order, but just that they are all equally component and they're not mutually exclusive. They, they support each other um, across the continuum and as you're developing the model, um, it, that there is going to be thinking and, and thoughts and processes that go back and forth between them. And so the first question that you need to ask yourself and really think about is who is your care coordination targeting? And how do you identify that target population? Where do, where do you begin? How do you know the most important needs of your community and establish that? And so what I'd like to spend a, a moment or two to talk about are some avenues of where you can identify the high need um, of some resources that are currently available to you and your community as well too, to help you understand the most need because we can't take care of everyone all at once. We love to, we want to. But in order to understand and develop an effective care model, it, it needs to be targeted around a population. And so some avenues and some, and some data resources that are available um, at your, you know, maybe not at your fingertips, that might be too, too simple in saying, but 
I, I do know that nonprofit hospitals, every three years, they, they are required to do a community health needs assessment. And, and what that is can be and provide a wealth of information from the people in your community on what their perceived and needed needs are for healthcare services, what their barriers can be um, to providing, why they aren't accessing care. You know, is it the hours of the clinic that aren't, aren't um, accessible to their work hours? Is it that they don't have reliable transportation, um, daycare, you know, um, you know, for their other kids at home? And, and again, you're going to hear some, some um, experience. I, I have a Medicaid, a strong, strong Medicaid background, so a lot of these examples are are from my experience working with um, the Medicaid population and Medicare population as well too. But this is information that you can gather um, to understand the needs and areas of opportunity in coordinating care with the people of your community. And so this community health needs assessment can be done in, in, you know, in, in different venues. It can be done um, and gathered through information from a survey. Um, where, where you create the sentences, or excuse me, the questions in the areas with your vendor that's doing that for you. It can be through focus groups. So you can host some focus groups targeted to specific populations within your community to have a facilitated discussion and understand um, what, what those needs are. It can be through with key stakeholder interviews. Um, with leadership um, of community organizations, businesses, employers in your community to understand their perceived needs, healthcare needs are for not only their, their the people that they serve, but also their employees as well too. And then another um, publicly available data, which can help help key in to needed areas in your community, is publicly available data um, through secondary data analysis. And so that, that can be public health data that's reported to your state um, um, health department, um, and CDC is another organization. But there's, there's data published out there that can break it down to the county level, and then you can compare it to your state and or, and or national level. And so that will really depend on the community and the state that you live in. But there's data available that can then help clue in if, if you don't know where to start in some high need areas. Another area it, it, to, to find the need is through, you know, your clinical data from your electronic health records. So that, that has a wealth of information, too. If you're data mining or querying your electronic health record, you could be looking at high utilizers of the emergency room. So then really narrowing in, what is your top diagnosis of those that are coming into the emergency room? You know, and how can you create a, a model of care to help address that, you know? Um, um, readmissions. I mean, those these are very key areas that I know are talked a lot about in in healthcare um, and the changing healthcare landscape. But really, what is that readmission diagnosis? What is the reason for that? And then creating a model of care um, around that um, to help support and 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 reduce that readmission rate. Another area that is really um, up and coming in areas as, as we're transitioning to these value-based models and having partnerships with different payer organizations is the payers' claims data. And that holds a wealth of knowledge. So it not only has the claims that your facility or clinic has, has submitted, but it's also going to give you feedback on what the people are, what and who and what services they're going for in other areas or other providers, the pharmacy data. So pharmacy data is key, and are they refilling their meds, you know, are on a timely basis as, as prescribed? Um, are they not, you know? So it, it provides some additional information too, and some pro and some measures to help be successful, and to measure the output of your care model as well too. More general focus care coordination models have been focused around Medicaid and Medicare. So if you have the opportunity within your state or in your community to focus on a population, care models have been, have been developed for those areas as well too, around children, complex patients as well. Registries are another area that can be um, focused around di disease specific and or immunization rates and things as well too. And so the next question, so then you've, you've, you've looked at the data that's available for your community, understanding where that need is and, and going through that, and you've got an idea. And so the next question that you, you really have to think through is, is that definition focused enough? Is the group too large? 
it's so important to be specific and that you need to have a successful goal or outcome in mind to the identified problem. And so it needs to be measurable. And so in an example here that we'll get to on our next slide is that it, we, we often, you know, see definitions of we are going to work with um, children, you know, improving children access to primary care. Well, that's great and that may seem narrow, but it's still broad because there's a lot of underlying issues or problems or maybe concerns within that that may need to be more specific to, around your care coordination model. And then the second area is, so once you've identified the area that you're going to be coordinating care around, you have a specific targeted population, how are you going to identify those individuals that meet that population definition? And, and this area is, is really like, okay, let's get going. Let's, you know, let's, let's test our model. Let's work with our community partners as well, too. But how are you going to identify them? And this is not only can you set up triggers in your electronic health record or your clinical systems of those high utilizers. We've used the ER um, example or the readmits. But as you establish and work with your community organizations and your partnerships, whether it be a school, um, behavioral health agencies or social service, public health, you're going to create some communication channels that will go back and forth. So you'll have referrals potential that may have been identified at the school before they've even hit your clinic. Or maybe because they haven't been accessing, you don't even know that they have issues or, or health care needs that, that you can work together on. So that's an important process to think through as well, too. And then these next two areas that I'll just bring up here is, is so once they've been identified, how are you going to um, communicate with the person? Um, is it going to be by phone, in person, or a combination? So dependent on the needs of the population that you're working with will really determine how you're going to work with and communicate with that person. Obviously, in a rural geographic region, it's not going to be cost effective to meet always in person, but maybe it's a kickoff introducing yourself, establishing that relationship and that trust with that person, but you need to understand um, how you're going to communicate and work with so that person in, and or caregiver engages in their care as well. And then underlying all of this is, as Joe mentioned, how are you going to use technology to identify, not only identify the population in those examples that I provided, but communicate with them and store progress and, and how your um, touch points with them, your documentation and, 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 and things like that. And so this is an example um, that I'd like to just walk through with you. We had the wonderful opportunity in August of this year to host a care coordination workshop and we created a tool to help walk through those questions that we just spoke about. And this is an example of one of our um, more mature networks that to provide an, to create a resource and an example for how a, a clinic facility or network would would fill it and and this is an example that I'll just walk through of how they used it and how they've used it in their structure and regarding um, the target population and so when they when they came to our workshop and when they answered this question question of target population who they're working with they said children and families that are having a hard time accessing mental health and health care. Great, it, you know, at first blush, you know, it, it, it's, it's around children and their families and they're having a hard time accessing mental health and health care. And so as they've been thinking about it and learning about, you know, what are we going to measure, how are we going to identify them, they realize that they're really not specific enough at, at, at first of who they're going to be working with, who they're going to be working with. And so, they, they are using this as to go back to their, their, their um, leadership, not only at their hospital, but also with their community partners, that they really need to narrow down their focus area of why children are having a hard time. What is that main issue? Maybe we create around our model of care regarding addressing um, that there aren't providers in, in, um, to help with some of those mental health issues, and how can we work with them to um, create access and, and things like that. How will their target population be identified? They are going to develop, once they further refine their definition, they're going to develop a specific referral mechanism between their partners not only, and their clinic and or, and or their hospital. 
they're going to clarify the needs of that along with that and doing it through some telephone calls as well. So they're go they've established that their model, this isn't very specific right here, and I would challenge you all to be more specific, but they are going to, to communicate via telephone and in person with the person as well. And what I mean by not very specific is as you're thinking that through and um, of communication in your model, it's important to think of what I call your touch points with the person and or your or your care team is how often do you need to check in with that person? And it may be individually specific, but in general, what, what, are, you, what are your underlying components of how frequent you need to be um, touching base with that person as well? They left their technology section blank on this um, because they, 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 I remember this conversation with them, is that they didn't, um, they hadn't thought that through. And so again, um, as you can tell by the, how their population will be identified, they, they aren't very specific there as well too, but they're, gonna, they're taking that back and, and this was an eye-opening that they needed to think more through how they were going to use technology in their, in their model. And the second area that I would really like to dive in um, to today is the assessment. And remember, assessment is a tool or a survey used by um, the care coordinator to assess a person's level of, level of care. Um, needed. And the this, this first question is, um, really, you need to ask yourself, based on your target population definition, is, is one needed? And commonly, the target population is, is generally defined, as, as we've talked about. And an assessment can help determine the level of social, environmental, mental health, physical and psychosocial need, functional needs that a person may have and need. So you can identify those up front and you can evaluate those as you're coordinating care to understand the level of not only the care coordination support, but also understand maybe what providers are needed to be brought to the table as well. The other um, 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 idea or, or area that an assessment can be used if your population is disease specific, it can really, it can be used as a um, risk or severity level of, of, of the diagnosis. And by understanding that risk or severity level will help, help you establish the level of coordination that you may need, those touch points that I referenced, but also can help you determine is the person getting better over the course of time as well too with the, with the care plan that has been developed with those interventions and that engagement of the person and the providers in that care. So it provides a measurement as well too, self-reported probably, but it provides a, a measurement as well to measure progress as you're going along as well. What assessment tool are you going to be, used, be using? Um, and, and really the type that, that, that will be used will be determined by the target population and your desired outcomes of, of the goals of your care coordination model. It could be um, functional based, it can be um, disease specific, um, you know, um, examples um, can, can be um, the, an MDS, it's, it's a screening that happens in long-term care. Um, it can be disease specific like a PQ, PQ9, um, one focused around asthma, different things like that as well too. It's really, there's a lot of best practices and tools available out there for tools that have been created to help, help meet this need. So then you have your assessment tool. You know what you're going to be used. You need to understand is how, how will it be used? Um, how will the results be used? I'm going to just click through these next, these next areas as well, too, because they, they all go together. And so you have the results. How are you going to communicate those results to the care team? How are you going to use it? Um, often results of, of, a, of an assessment can be used in developing the care plan the needed interventions and supports that that person is needed to be successful in engaging in their care, participating, and having those outcomes that you need. How are you going to share those results um, with your care team? So not only do you have your care team involved in the hospital and or the clinic setting, but you're also going to be having um, additional partners involved in that person's care. So how are you going to exchange the information of the results? Is it necessary to? These are just all questions that you need to think through. And how will you store that information 
um, that you've learned from, from, from the results of the assessment. Again, that's important information to think about up front. Um, and again, technology, um, as Joe mentioned and as, as we're talking about, is, is that supporting function to do all, to a lot of this as well. And the example, to carry on the example from our care coordination workshop and um, the, the network that completed it, this is how they completed their, their worksheet, their component, the assessment tool component. They are going to use an assessment tool. They, they need one because um, they're working with mental health and children. And these are the four assessment tools that they've decided that, that are important to them in establishing a care plan. Ages and stages questionnaire, pediatric symptom checklist, the child depression inventory, PHQ-9, the GAD-7, and that's, that's around adult screening and, and for more adult teenagers. So they, they've determined that one is needed, they've identified potential assessment tools, and they're going to use it to help develop their care plan. They, they didn't really answer the question in regards to how it's being communicated, but they, they did say that the care coordinator in their, their model is really the one using and doing that screening, and that it's stored with their records. And currently, they're using their screening, and it's done with pen and paper, and they're scanning it into their electronic health record but they're hoping to be able to incorporate this in an electronic way that, it, that they don't have that extra paper sample as well. So just looking at the time, we're at about a quarter two, or just shy of a quarter two. Um, I'd, I'll pause here for any questions or thoughts before I touch on what we're going to be talking about tomorrow as well. Alyssa? Yes. How, yes. how do people find that tool or worksheet that you were um, showing on the screen there? Is it oh, on great, our website? Great, 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 great. Yes, it is. It is on our website. Um, um, and I apologize, I'm hearing a little feedback in the background here. Um, um, but it's under our network, under our network uh, program, program website on ruralcenter.org and you can search by care coordination workshop, and then all of the tools and resources are part of that as well. Great, thank you. If anyone else has a question, feel free to type it in the chat box or press star two to unmute, or you can hover over my name in the attendee list and send, send a private question if you'd like as well. Alyssa, there's a question uh, from someone how formal okay. of a system okay. do we need to have? That's a, that's a, that's great, a great, great question. question. Um, um, and I think it depends, think it depends on, on the structure that you're structure creating that you're or the partnerships, partnerships you are. Um, um, my personal opinion and what we're seeing as we're working with organizations that have established models of care is that it's very, very important to understand everyone's roles and responsibilities in their model of care. And so that tends to lead us to be a more formal structure in the sense of having a, maybe a memorandum of understanding outlining as you're working through these steps of identifying the need of the community, um, the partners that you're bringing to the table, who's doing what, that it's delineated in that memorandum of understanding. Um, and so I think that provides, it's a lot of work up front. What we've talked about today, I'm not shortchanging the time and, and the value in it because it's important and it does take time building that collaboration and, and Deb will go into more detail on that tomorrow, but it, it, it helps lead a successful platform and, and, and area for people to understand their roles and those hands-offs between each other. So I, I'm an advocate of a formal system in the sense of defining, clearly defining roles and responsibilities of a care coordination model and having documented policies and procedures in that so you have those educational tools to fall back on when you're training and identifying who's doing what. Great, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Alyssa, what population would you suggest we start with? Those with chronic care conditions, the elderly? That's, that's a, another good question and I think um, is a loaded question in the, in the sense of um, going back to thinking about those most at need and 
um, and depending on who you're asking that question to, might be if, if I'm a payer, it's going to be those that are the high cost ones, those that are not participating in their care um, and diving into understanding those needs and what those diagnoses are and what those supports and partner organizations can be to help, help establish that. If, um, so that's one aspect of, of being able to identify where to be as those high cost utilizers, those um, high users of the ER. Another area is, again, really um, you know your community best, those resources, those data, um, database, those, those data sources that I spoke about a bit ago, understanding from, through your community health needs assessment, through focus groups, um, through your own clinical outcomes, what, what you're seeing in your own clinical and hospital practice is, is a great, what I really recommend is each hospital and community does is understanding what, what their most first important need is. And so is, is understanding, understanding that, that data that's already available and what you have available through your electronic health record as well. So I know that didn't really answer it, give a clear cut, but the answer is, is really looking at the, the data that's available and what you know about your community and the needs of your community. Okay, thanks Alyssa. Anyone else have a question for Alyssa or um, maybe perhaps a technology sure. IT question for Joe? All right. Well, Alyssa, Joe, and Deb will be back tomorrow. Yep, Thanks.